to GFR is above 95 mils per minute. Um, so basically a healthy person. Right. Um, it's contraindicated. You can't use it because apparently you're going to clear it too fast. So. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Core Consult RX podcast. My name is Mike Corvino. With me is my co-host, Cole Swanson. Cole, what is up? Nothing much. So, how many f- days of pharmacy school do you have left? Three. Three days. Three days. Of pharmacy it's school. It's all over. And it's all over. Mm-hmm. Man, that's a good feeling, right? No, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, I remember leaving schools i was my last rotation was in usc yeah and i remember leaving school that last day and being like huh well that's just it huh? i just got <laughs> just done with school yeah and then i got mm-hmm. home and jen and ashley had drawn like chalk everywhere like five-year-olds and just said <laughs> welcome home dr corvino and all this stuff and people were driving by and, like looking at me and, on the car no no it was on the it was on the pavement but it was just freaking uh, out everywhere okay and so yeah i was it, no, I'm pretty pumped. No pomp and circumstance, I doubt it. But uh, yeah, I'll I'll go home Friday. I've been told I'll basically get off pretty early, so nice. it'll, it'll be a good day. Yes, and then maybe this weekend we'll go out for some victory wings or something. There you go. Because we gotta celebrate for sure. Yeah, and then we get to take off candidate on the iTunes. I know. Yeah, I've been be official. To do that. Can we do that then, or yeah. do I have to pass those board thingies? No, because you've already met the requirements for Farm Day. Okay. I mean, I mean, plus. <laughs> I asked iTunes. They said it was fine. <laughs> as long as iTunes says yeah, it's cool. Yeah, iTunes doesn't give a crap. <laughs> and Spotify, you know, we got to get their permission. Yeah, as long as Spotify's on board. That's the big one. That took yeah. us forever. <laughs> Finally cracked them. Yeah. So what about uh, what about your fiance? When does she graduate? July. Okay. So, so theirs um, is longer. Yeah, they um, PAs. They go through the summer and all that kind of stuff. Ugh. So I know. Okay. What's so, up with that? So you're going to be celebrating while she's still... Yes. On rotation. So she just so. started her third to last rotation. So she only has three left. Gotcha. Yeah. Oh, well, she's almost done too then. Yeah. And your brother graduates the same day as you? Same day as me. Yeah. He's actually already done. So he... He's you know, done. He's doctors. just chilling. Yeah. I don't know what... You know, they got hmm. nothing to do. Nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. That's cool. So he's done. So we uh, got to get him back on here before he leaves. Yeah. Said he wants to. Said it was fun. So... Hope yeah. you all enjoyed it. It was just released, right? A few days ago. Or uh, the audio was a couple weeks ago. I last don't week. We can have I've whatever. lost track. Either way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, y'all 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 might think that we're again in a new studio, but no. <laughs> nope. Nope. Just a new background. We trashed the old one. Immediately. We of had course. It lasted two episodes. So I was like, <laughs> I don't like it. We'll just redo the entire thing. So now we have the new awesome one. And um of course we have a T Rex. Yes, we have Don't worry about it. D T Rex R X. <laughs> It doesn't have much to do with pharmacy, but I saw the painting and I was like, yep, that's coming home. We should discuss the nicknames before the podcast. <laughs> no, we're going to improv them as usual. <laughs> so yeah, for those of you watching the video content and you were wondering the whole time why this T-Rex picture with graffiti on it is on the wall, mm, I don't have a good reason. Yeah. I just thought the picture was awesome. That was so. pretty cool. We can put it right up on that wall. Yeah, more to come. Oh, yes. More to come. Good job, Iconic. Shout out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... What are we going to talk about today? Well, I thought we could take on some anticoagulation, maybe talk about VTEs, uh, pulmonary embolisms, DVTs, and give you all a little overview of those. And I think we even talked a little bit about anticoagulation in the stroke podcast a while back, Uh, but we'll revisit a little bit of that and hopefully go into a little more detail about how to choose um, these agents and which one might be better in what situation. Yeah, I can't remember how deep we went in with that stroke. I don't think we I think yeah. we just kind of touched on it. Yeah, I don't think we went very deep. I think we just touched on the DOAX slash NOAX. If anybody knows what people are calling them these days, please let me know. I'm going with DOAX. Cause, yeah, I hear DOAX more so now. Yeah, but because um, NOAX. Really no, novel anymore. Exactly, but somebody said, um, what'd they say? Uh, I can't remember. It's something about the N meaning something different now, which oh continues it on. I don't know. Stupid. Yeah. I'm going with Doax. Doax. Yeah. That person good. doesn't know what they're talking about. Yeah. Either way, that's what we're talking about. Um, so, yeah, we can just get it started. Cool. What do you want to start? Uh, so, we can start with what. So, VTE, basically, I was a little confused about this throughout school. Um, it means venous thromboembolism, but basically, it's an umbrella term for a DVT. Um, or a PE, pulmonary embolism, and DVT is um, deep vein thrombosis. 
So that kind of breaks those down into different categories. PE, there's an acute PE, subacute, and chronic. Um, the acute typically develops with symptoms and signs immediately uh, when it happens. Subacute it might be days or weeks following before you see symptoms. And chronic is very slowly over the course of potentially many years um, and usually develops with symptoms of pulmonary hypertension. With DVT, there's two main ones, and basically it's either a proximal DVT or it's a distal DVT. So proximal DVT is basically above the knee. Distal DVT is below the knee. So you could kind of assume which one might be worse. Uh, the proximal being above the knee is going to be more significant, and the distal being below the knee um, isn't as bad. Of course, it needs to be paid attention to. Um, but depending on the situation, you may not actually anticoagulate in that um in that disease state. So we'll talk about that as we go on. So which one, what do you want to start as far as you want to just kind of go through the drugs? Yeah. So let's, let's say a patient has a new onset VTE. So what, what are, what's going through our mind? What's the first thing we're thinking about? So as far as actually like treating a patient with an anticoagulant, um, we, we really have to kind of consider one, uh, where the patient is. So if they're inpatient, you know, we're probably going to go with something like a low molecular weight heparin. Mm -hmm. um, if they are going to be outpatient, um, then we would, depending on what we would use, we would use either a combination of products um, or one of the, the DOACs. Um, but, it, you know, it depends on what the patient's insurance profile looks like. It depends on whether or not they would be adherent to certain regimens, whether or not they think they're going to actually follow up and get testing done if testing is needed. So there's a lot of kind of socioeconomic things that we have to consider before we can just pick one of these medications. Yeah, and I think it would actually, like you mentioned, be good just to briefly mention kind of the drugs we'll be talking about. So there's low molecular weight heparins. Uh, the main one people think about is Lovenox, which is anoxaparin, but there's also daltaparin. Um, there's unfractionated heparin. Uh, there's fondaparinux, which is a factor 10A inhibitor, but it's injectable. And then there's the DOAX. So with the DOAX, you have rivaroxaban, edoxaban, and apixaban are all factor 10A inhibitors. And then there's dabigatran, which is a direct thrombin inhibitor. Along with all those is warfarin, which is a vitamin K antagonist. And those are the big ones that we're going to be talking about today. There are other ones, but that's what we'll focus on. So if they're inpatient and warranted inpatient treatment, like you said, a low molecular weight heparin, probably Lovenox would be the treatment of choice. Um, if they had severe renal dysfunction in that same situation, you might go with unfractionated heparin. Um, if they had a history of HIT or if they developed HIT, um, you would probably go with um, fondaparinux, and HIT is heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Yes. So, you know, let's talk about warfarin real quick. Um, I guess that's a, as good a place I've ever just, or as any to start. But, sure. Um, you know, if we are going to start the patient on warfarin, um, you have to consider the fact that you have to measure the INR of the patient, which mm -hmm. is basically telling whether or not the blood is too thick, too thin, or where we kind of want it. So for most situations, we usually keep the INR between two and three. Um, other uh, situations like, um, what is it, uh, like mitral valve. Stenosis um, and maybe a um, or repair. Yeah, yeah. They, they would have like 2.5 to 3.5, but um, there'd be other goals. But usually two to three is kind of a safe bet. And so if it starts going below two, the patient is, um, too, his blood is too thick, it's too coagulable. And then if it is uh, above three, then we are worried about the blood becoming too thin. So we want to keep it in that range. Um, the problem is, is whenever we're first starting warfarin, we have to measure, measure that INR quite often until we can kind of get stabilized and make sure that the dose is going to stay uh, the same, stay constant. And so... You know, you have to make sure that the patient's actually going to come back. And, you know, they may have to come back every couple of days, every three days or so when you first start, and then every week for a little bit. So it's definitely a commitment, and you have to make sure this patient's going to follow up. Sure. Because if you start patient on warfarin and you have no way of controlling or, or calculating their INR because they're never in, coming back to the clinic, uh, it could definitely get dangerous. Sure. And, um, yeah, and so in those first zero to ten days of treatment, um, is some of the more significant time where there's um, a potential for a recurrence of a DVT or PE. Um, and so warfarin in those situations may not be the best option because obviously you've got to get them therapeutic. 
So in that time, you're actually going to bridge with probably either unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin or the most common until you get that INR therapeutic. Uh, but backtracking a little bit, I guess I should probably talk a little bit about um, risk factors and uh, where you might see a patient develop a DVT or PE. So of course, a DVT is going to be um, a clot in one of those sections of the leg, like I mentioned. Um, if something happens and the clot breaks off, it becomes an embolism travels up the vein, and it can get stuck um, basically in the lung. And so what happens if it gets stuck? It's going to embolize. It's going to cause ischemia of the lung. Um, and over time, sometimes acutely or chronically, depending on um, how significant the clot is, it's going to cause a deterioration of the lung tissue, uh, scarring. People can recover and frequently do from them, maybe never fully, um, but they can also be fatal. So it's, it's definitely... Um, an emergency if someone has a PE DVT not necessarily um, the DVT you're going to notice if it's symptomatic swelling and pain or tenderness uh, maybe warmth around the legs where the DVT is with a PE you might notice dyspnea painful breathing um, coughing up blood or increased heart rate those are things you might notice with a PE so who are the patients that get them um, as you get older it's higher risk for one of these um, if you have a history of VTE, then you're going to be more likely to have one of these um, hypercoagulable states, uh, cancer being one of them. Also, pregnancy puts you at higher risk. So these are the types of patients you're gonna, that you're going to see um, develop either a DVT or PE. And um, also risk factors to look out for uh, if you're considering a patient for DVT or PE prophylaxis in the hospital or elsewhere. So you, you kind of mentioned bridging with anoxaparin, and I think this is something that gets people very confused as to why you need to do this in the first place. And then also, you know, we, we standardly say, you know, give a five-day bridge, and then we think of them as being uh, at goal INR, hopefully, or anticoagulated, and so they can stop the anoxaparin. But, you know, the real thing we have to consider is, well, what if the INR is not where we need it to be? We've already done our five days of bridge therapy. Do we continue or do we stop? Um, do we have to keep going? Um, and so I think it's important to kind of look at why we bridge in the first place. So, you know, vitamin K, like Cole said, is something that's going to block, um, you know, vitamin, or sorry, warfarin is going to block vitamin K. And so, you know, but it doesn't actually block like the absorption or the binding of vitamin K. Um, what warfarin does is, you know, your body uses vitamin K to activate certain clotting factors. It's like this, uh, this catalyst almost or a cofactor as your body's taking, uh, so like factor 10, for instance, when factor 10 becomes factor 10A or activated, um, you actually have to use some vitamin K up so in its reduced form to shuttle that reaction forward and allow the vitamin K to, or the uh, factor 10 to become activated. So what's left over though is this a uh, vitamin K epoxide. So you have this uh, vitamin K then epoxide group, um, but your body doesn't have like stores of vitamin K where it can just use them up or release them at this point. So you have to basically use what you have. And so you recycle this, this used vitamin K back to its reduced form with this enzyme called vitamin K epoxide reductase. And that is actually what warfarin is blocking. And so what's already in your body as far as vitamin K is kind of irrelevant. Um, you know, once it's still going to be able to clot and cause the uh, clotting factors to become activated and work down that clotting cascade, um, it's catching it on the backside so that it's not able to do it a second time right. and recycle that, um, which is great and that's fine. But the problem is we also have you know, the opposite of our clotting factors, which is our um, natural anticoagulation factors. So we have protein C, protein S, um, antithrombin 3. You know, we have our natural anticoagulation. That's what keeps our blood at hemostasis and allows everything to flow normally. But you know, the problem is, is that protein C, protein S, especially protein C, actually has a really short half-life compared to some of the other uh, clotting factors. And so when you start warfarin, you're actually disrupting the protein C quicker than the other actual clotting factors. And so you're, you're wiping out your body's natural anticoagulation. 
and so you only have your clotting factors left over, all of those factors that have already become activated because warfarin hasn't been able to shut off the, their supply of vitamin K yet, then you actually put the patient at risk for throwing a second clot. They're right. in a hypercoagulable state. And so if the INR is still showing after that five days that we kind of do as a standard, if the five days is, is not enough to get them to be at a therapeutic INR, we need to keep bridging to make right. sure that they don't have another clot. Right. I think, um, don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure it's two consecutive days of a therapeutic INR before you would, even if it's been the five days, before you would remove the, the bridge the bridge, and just continue them on warfarin. And then there's some wiggle room, you know, if it goes low or it goes high, then you just adjust the dose and you don't really freak out about it. Right. Um, but yeah, that, that goes to a good point that if a patient has one of these other coagulopathies like protein C and protein S, they're going to be in a hypercoagulable state pretty much their whole lives. Um, there's not too much you can do about it. Um, some people say, hmm, maybe we should, um, we should anticoagulate those people because they're at higher risk for uh, clots. You know, we're not going to talk about that today, mainly because I don't know the answer to whether you should or not, but I think it's <laughs> controversial either way. I'm assuming it's probably controversial. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with that. Um, I like it. But yeah, so we, that's warfarin. Great. We now understand the physiology of warfarin. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the other medications. So like we said, warfarin probably isn't your best acute option. It really just depends on the patient, though. And we're going to talk about a lot of the different factors that you have to consider. Um, so acutely, what do you want to go ahead and start? Um, you could do a DOAC, uh, like we talked about for, uh, heparin and those things. But you could do a DOAC. Uh, there's rivaroxaban and apixaban both. You can just start and um, within a day and really within hours, I think, um, the patient is considered fully anticoagulated. Um, now, the other two, dabigatran and adoxaban, they actually require a bridge. Why is that, you ask? Because they have similar mechanisms of action, because that's really just how they were studied. So they were studied with a bridge um, to a point before you could take off the heparin um, or the low molecular weight heparin and continue the adoxaban or dabigatran monotherapy, but you can't just start it as monotherapy. So um, just in my humble opinion, might not be the best option acutely. Otherwise, you might as well just use low molecular weight heparin unless you plan, you just want that drug to keep them on long term. Um, whether that's an insurance thing or not, uh, you know, that just depends on the patient. So that's kind of what you're looking at in the first 10 days. After that, we get into the long term treatment and, um, and what we're kind of looking at. So let's say that um, a patient comes in with a DVT. Uh, are you going to anticoagulate them and for how long? So it really just depends. It depends on if it's an unprovoked DVT, so that means it's worse, basically meaning that there wasn't something in their lives that caused them to have this. It just kind of happened. And so now they're going to be at much higher risk for recurrent DVTs. If it's a provoked DVT, um, then that means something happened. Maybe they went on a long plane ride or a long trip where they were uh, immobile or they had a recent surgery um, and that is a little bit lower risk because it's like okay we can identify why they got this dvt um, but especially if it's something transient like a surgery that they're not going to have again um, that's even better than if it's like cancer where they're kind of now constantly in a hypercoagulable state that's still also concerning so those are all things that you have to think about when you're t determining if you want to anticoagulate somebody and for how long yeah absolutely and so all the different agents have their own um, basically dosing for treating a DVT and so for instance the river rocks bands are alto uh, you start off with 15 milligrams twice a day you do that for three weeks and then you switch to 20 milligrams once daily that's kind of like the treatment you know, dosing. If somebody is on it for, let's say they have AFib and they need to be on anticoagulation to prevent uh, them throwing a clot and having a stroke, then uh, you would be on just 20 milligrams unless the patient needed, you know, dose reduction for renal clearance or whatever. But uh, they would be on 20 milligrams daily. You wouldn't start with that 15 twice a day. And so one of the things that the company did to make things a little bit easier on the patient, now it's not always this ca the case because we most pharmacies don't carry it, but they have this little starting pack. It's the first four weeks of your treatment therapy where you have uh, basically three weeks, 21 days worth of your 15 milligram tablets twice a day. And then you have 20 milligrams built into the same blister pack that you start on week four. And so the patients can kind of follow that and then they just start the normal 
uh, Zeralta once daily after that for as long as they're going to be on the therapy. All right. And speaking of how long they're going to be on it, um, that also very much depends. So generally for a first time provoked VTE, um, so that's DVT or PE, you're looking at a minimum of three months of anticoagulation. Um, so that's pretty much best case scenario. Uh, you want to consider a patient's bleed risk. Uh, there's a lot of factors that go into that. Uh, age, history of GI bleeds and whatnot um, for whether you're going to initiate it or not. Pretty much one of the big times where you may consider not is if it's a distal DVT and it's asymptomatic and maybe you just happen to find it. Um, you can kind of make that judgment call based on the patient. Um, but if you determine that the risk of bleeding outweighs the benefit of starting anticoagulation, then it's kind of your call whether you want to anticoagulate them or not, just generally speaking. Uh, but three months is pretty much the minimum. In certain populations, you can consider longer for six to 12 months. If it was a really bad clot, um, specifically a phlegmasia cerulea dolens, um, that's the best I'm going to be able to pronounce that. But basically, that's just a really bad clot. Um, or if they have a risk factor that you determined provoked the VTE or the DVT um, that is prolonged past that three-month time and you think they need longer anticoagulation. Um, but generally, if all those have um, subsided, it's a transient risk factor and it's no longer present, um, then three months should be adequate. Now, there are certain patients who are going to need indefinite anticoagulation, uh, specifically if it's a recurrent DVT or PE, um, or if they have ongoing risk factors that might be lifelong. Um, those are situations when you might consider indefinite, but that's also controversial. Um, maybe the patient doesn't have that, and it was their first unprovoked um, DVT, and you determine that they're high risk and you want to leave them on it indefinitely. Um, it, it doesn't, it's not necessarily wrong either way. It just depends on the patient, um, and what the chest guidelines say. So you could look for that for guidance for sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the other one that we see commonly is, um, a Pixaban Eliquis. And, um, now this one does seem to have a little bit uh, better results when it was compared to warfarin. Um, mo all of these were studied head to head in warfarin or against warfarin, um, particularly in patients that had AFib. So they were using anticoagulation as a preventative measure. Um, and then uh, they they were looking at things like obviously the the occurrence of having some sort of a, an event as well as bleed risk, um, and then looking at uh, hemorrhagic bleeds, things like that. And the one that seems to be superior is apixaban um, when you look at all the data. Um, so Xarelto still was a little bit better than warfarin as well, um, but apixaban seems like it's kind of the best one. Um, the issue is you have to take it twice a day. So you have to worry about adherence. Right. Um, so that could potentially be an issue. Um, and then, you know, the other big issue is just like we always talk about, you have to consider the patient's insurance plan because some of them prefer Xeralto because they've either, you know, that's just what they picked or they've done a deal with them um, or whatever it is. But, you know, if, they, if that's the case, you have to make sure the patient can actually get their anticoagulation um, if you send them home with a script. For sure. Yeah. So like you mentioned, um, compliance is a big issue. So we talked about how uh, DOAX, once you take them, you're basically considered fully anticoagulated. If you skip a dose and miss a day, then you're considered fully unanticoagulated. So if you have a patient who really has compliance issues, and um, so you might consider, yeah, the once a day rivaroxaban long term compared to the twice a day apixaban. Um, but if they, if you really are concerned that they're missing doses and they're going to be uncoagulated, you might actually go with warfarin. Um, so I think to me, when I first learned about these, I thought, well, somebody with poor compliance, I would rather them be on a once daily easy DOAC than, rather than warfarin where they have to have follow up every four to six weeks and they have to keep their INR in a certain range. But basically what it is, is if you take too much or you take too little, you your INR might drop to like 1.7 or something over a day or maybe 1.4 over a few days but it'll be if it'll be a little while before you're completely uncoagulated or I should say unanticoagulated um so warfarin may actually be a better option a patient who has poor compliance it's also going to be the cheapest option uh, you may have mentioned it or not um but DOAX depending on the insurance can be expensive so if a patient is uninsured 
um, and they just really can't afford it, then warfarin may be their best option. Um, even I mean, you also have to consider the follow up and how much that's going to cost, but um, it just it depends. You got to work with your patient to figure out what's best. So the the other option that I know me I personally don't ever see this medication being uh, written for or dispensed or whatever, but it's uh, Edoxaban. Yeah, that's Cerveza is the brand name. It's kind of new, relatively speaking. Yeah, and I mean it just it's one of those that did not really seem to take off like the other ones did. Because I mean. It's been out since I graduated, yeah. Um, so it's been out for a few years. I just never see really anybody on it. Yeah. Um, part of the reason is if you're actually treating a DVT, you have to bridge with this. Even though it's a factor 10 inhibitor, you still have to bridge yeah. whenever you are uh, initiating a Doxman. And that um, seems to come down from the fact that they just that's how they studied it. Yeah. So I, I don't know why they studied that. I don't know if there's something more to the story than that that I'm just being ignorant about, but um, that's definitely, in my opinion, would hurt uh, the chances of somebody using this one over, say, a Pixaban. Right. Now, that's how I understand it, too. And a Doxaban also has some, like, weird renal um, dosing, not, like, in poor renal function, but in good renal function. So, basically, the sweet spot for a Doxaban is between uh, a creatinine clearance between 50 and 95 is where you get that 60 milligram dose. If it's below 50 and above 15, you have a 30 milligram dose, but if your creatinine clearance, I mean, yeah, your creatinine clearance or GFR is above 95 mils per minute. Um, so basically a healthy person, right. Um, it's contraindicated. You can't use it because apparently you're going to clear it too fast. So yeah, there's, there's some significant barriers, which they all have their little nuances, which we won't get into all of those, but it picks a ban. If you have increased age and potentially poor renal function and, um, you're of a certain weight, you might need to be dose adjusted and whatnot. Um, and all of these are renally adjusted. So I don't know if we mentioned, but warfarin is the one you would want to use, um, in poor renal function. And actually I have, um, a nice little table that I kind of wanted to talk about, um, considering what you should choose in a specific situation. So we talked about cancer, um, puts you in a hypercoagulable state. The drug of choice in cancer is one of the low molecular weight heparins, probably Lovenox. Um, also in pregnancy or you're at risk for pregnancy, you would want to go with low molecular weight heparin. Um, I mentioned poor compliance. You probably want to consider warfarin in that situation. If they don't want any injections at all, then you would have to choose rivaroxaban or apixaban because everything else is either an injection or it's going to require a bridge um, with an injection. So if that's a consideration, then you would either have to use rivaroxaban or apixaban. The once daily options, rivaroxaban we talked about, idoxaban and warfarin can also both be once daily, but the rest aren't going to be probably. Um, and other than that, cost and everything, it really just varies between um, the agents, the patient's insurance, and all of the follow-up and whatnot that's going to be considered. We talked about the INR with warfarin. Um, the DOACs don't really have any um, monitoring as far as coagulation goes, uh, but you would want to follow up every once in a while. So um, the clinic I was at that did anticoagulation, I think that when we started a DOAC, one month later, we would follow up with renal function labs and a CBC, um, basically just to make sure they're not bleeding out anywhere, um, check hemoglobin, hematocrit, and all that sort of stuff. And then we would do another follow-up at three months, and then after that, they're pretty much good to go. Uh, don't even know that we followed up at all after that, maybe once a year. Um, but with warfarin, like we said, every four to six weeks, so it's definitely a consideration. And I guess technically you could get an anti-factor 10A if you yes. were concerned about them not taking it. Right. Uh, there's always that option. Um, I don't I don't know off the top of my head any other labs you would draw, but I think that's a readily available lab that you could no, get. No, you can. And um, I know that in the hospital they do that for Lovenox, even though you don't actually have to monitor for Lovenox. I think it depends on the protocol in your hospital. Um, but they actually had a certain... Um, anti 10 a level they wanted to get to and then they didn't do any other monitoring i think cardiology depending on what disease state it was could monitor outpatient but they just wanted they had a goal and then they didn't even look at it anymore um, and that's really institution specific whether or not you're going to look at that with um, lovenox or with a doac right so and i know we mentioned uh if if you have reduced renal function that you'd be on warfarin. I know you said that, mm -hmm. but did we say the something the table has less than 30 is kind of like their cutoff for right. it? Um, so that's think about around that range is when you would at least consider right switching over to the warfarin again, right? 
Yeah, definitely a consideration. So there's a, um, if you're trying to decide between Wharf and a Doax, I think when we were in school, um, or at least when I was, the Doax were, they were then no ax. Um, and they were kind of the new big thing. And everybody's like, hey, there's no monitoring. Don't worry about it. This is like what we want to go for as long as the patient can afford it. So I was like, okay, so really the only times I would use warfarin um, is if the patient couldn't afford a DOAC or if a DOAC was contraindicated. Um, but there's some other things to consider. So we talked about the dosing. Um, dietary restrictions would be more in favor of the DOACs because there's really not any, but of course you need to uh, keep a consistent vitamin K intake with warfarin. Um, warfarin has a lot more drug interactions than DOACs, but DOACs do have some. Um, warfarin does have a reversal agent. So if that's something that you want because a patient's like really high risk for bleeding and if they go into the hospital, you want to be able to reverse it, you can just use vitamin K and other things to reverse warfarin. Uh, right now, the Bigatran is the only one with a reversal agent. Um, Praxbind, right? I think the generic is Idarusimab. Yeah, pra- yeah, I think so. Idarusizumab or, or mm-hmm. pra- something like that. Yeah. Um, but uh, isn't there something on the pipeline potentially? Yeah, I think uh, I've even heard talks of like next month, the uh, Factor Ten reversal agent could could come to market. There you go. So it's definitely coming. Um, Let's talk real quick, too, since we're on the subject of a reversal. You mentioned vitamin K for a warfarin reversal. Um, I think that's kind of one of the things that gets confusing a little bit as far as when we would actually reverse um, and based on an INR and all that. Sure. So think about if we have a patient that uh, you, you check their INR. Again, you want it between two and three in most cases, and let's see, it comes back and it's a four. Um, now the patient doesn't have any bleeding, so that's good. If they're bleeding, you need to make sure that you reverse it and stop the bleeding. Um, if they're not bleeding, they're just their blood's thinner than normal, but they're not bleeding. Um, then you typically would want to just skip a dose of the warfarin, and then you may want to consider reducing the dose, um, but you, you you may not. It may only take one skipping one dose, and then you just wanted to monitor that in R very closely. Um, and make sure that it's going back in that therapeutic range. Sure, and it, it, a lot of it depends on the history from the patient. So they're like, yeah, I uh, I binge drank last night and my r r went up. Um, and you're like, okay, well, you're going to binge drink again? No. Okay, well, then hold a dose today, maybe even a half dose tomorrow, and we won't um, change your dose. But um, if you everything seems the same, um, they were good on this dose a few months ago, but now it's increased, then, yeah, you might consider decreasing it. Interestingly, I might have this backwards, but I'm pretty sure, like, binge drinking. So alcohol, you generally would think, would increase the INR, right? Um, but that's really with a large influx of alcohol um, over a short period of time, like acutely. If someone's a chronic alcoholic um, or just a chronic alcohol user, their INR could actually go down because of that. So just something uh, to consider. Yeah. And that being said, and then I'll go back to the reversal, but um, you were mentioning the vitamin K diet. It, you know, I don't mean to insult anyone's intelligence, but there are people, especially, you know, maybe students who get this still confused a little bit because sometimes you, you get the impression that we want to stop them from having like a vitamin K rich diet. Yeah. And that's not the case. We just want to make sure that it's consistent. So if you eat a ton of spinach, I'm not telling you that you shouldn't eat spinach anymore because it's good for you. But what I'm saying Popeye. is that, yeah, yeah. exactly. It's a documentary. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's one of those things that we want to make sure that it's consistent. So if you eat spinach every night, keep eating spinach every night. Because once we get you to that therapeutic INR, then, then we're good. The problem is once, if we have like a random salad bar somewhere and I pound the spinach buffet and all this vitamin K is now reentered into my system, you know, again, remember vitamin or vitamin K epoxide reductase after you have, you're recycling that used vitamin K back is really what warfarin is blocking. So all this new vitamin K that you just, you just ate is in its reduced form and it can actually start pushing those clotting factors to become activated again. And so that's where the risk of a clot actually comes from. And so it's not that you're overriding the warfarin or anything like that. You're basically just feeding it back into the beginning of the cycle. And uh, the warfarin doesn't have a chance to shut it off until after it activates its clotting factors at least one more time. Yeah. So, all right. So we talked about an INR less than 4.5. If we have an INR 4.5 to 10, so 10 is, I mean, sounds like a ton, right? We're obviously going to treat those people. But um, as long as they're not bleeding, uh, we actually probably would hold off on the vitamin K. 
um, you know, unless they actually needed surgery or something like that, um, we would hold one to two doses of the warfarin, and then we would probably resume a lower dose than we st- we had on originally until that INR comes back down again and uh, is therapeutic. So we don't necessarily see an INR of nine and then panic and immediately start giving vitamin K. Um, now, when the INR is above ten, that's when we would consider giving vitamin K uh, either like a two point five to five milligram. Um, Mephitin is the brand name for it that it comes in. Um, and then we would resume a lower dose warfarin and again monitor INR. Now, major bleeding, that's when we automatically would want to reverse. Um, we would probably give it over a slow IV push um, or a slow IV rather and then um, check for uh, whether or not we need to give four factor prothrombin complex and, and get them to s- stop the bleeding. Because mm-hmm. if we're giving vitamin k yes we can coagulate but we may not actually stop the bleeding so we want to make right. sure they don't bleed out so with a major bleed for sure and even with a minor bleed if it's not stopping um you would probably consider at least holding the warfarin and um if it's really continuing um may give a low dose vitamin k too um but yeah, if they're not bleeding it's really not all that huge of a deal when you see a seven or an eight some mine arm machines only go up to like 14 so if it's above that you may not even know yeah um but it is important for all of these medications to be able to recognize signs and symptoms of bleeding. So um, what do you want to look for and what do you want to tell patients? So of course, black tar colored stools, black tarry stools, um, you're thinking more of an upper GI bleed type of situation, but still a bleed. Um, unusual bruising or nosebleeds that are um, especially frequent and that take a long time to stop. Um, a headache, potentially Um, a very bad headache that somebody might describe as the worst headache of their life. Um, You'd be concerned for an intracranial hemorrhage there. Um, Obviously a more severe situation. Uh, Bright red blood in the stool. Uh, Bleeding of the gums when you brush your teeth is pretty common that patients will describe. Um, Or if they've had a fall, then you would want to be concerned for a bleed if they're on an anticoagulant, especially if they're elderly. Um, May send them in for a CT just to make sure they're not bleeding in the brain. Yes. So um, let's talk real quick, too. This is kind of random. We probably should have actually come up with an outline before we just started this, but that's all right. So <laughs> the uh, let's talk real quick about some of the interactions because warfarin has so many of them. Yeah, sure. Um, so warfarin is a substrate for uh, cytochrome P450 2C9. Uh, it's a major substrate for, the, for 2C9, and then it's a minor substrate for 1A2, 2C19, and then also 3A4. So, obviously, a lot of our major SIPs, we're only missing 2D6 out of there. Yeah. Uh, other than that, I mean, we've covered a good chunk of them. Yep. So, you know, we have to consider the drug-drug interactions with warfarin. Um, so, just some examples of 2C9 inducers, uh, which could potentially decrease that INR, um, would be like carbamazepine, uh, phenobar, which we probably don't see too much anymore, uh, phenytoin, and then St. John's wort, and I, hopefully if you've been around any kind of a pharmacy school especially, they always harp on this one, that uh, you shouldn't ever let a patient take St. John's wort because one, it's not efficacious, and two, uh, it's got just every drug interaction you can think of. But uh, there are patients that still take it, and so it's something to keep an eye out for. Um, and then as far as uh, 2C9 inhibitors that are kind of common drugs, we have amiodarone, we have flagyl, we have uh, sulfamethoxazole, trimethoprim, Bactrim, fluconazole, ketoconazole, voriconazole. So, you know, some pretty common medications. And so we would have to worry about an increase in INR um, with uh, any of those while they're taking warfarin. Yeah, pretty much any antibiotic, run a drug interaction check yeah. just to make sure. Especially if it's short term, they can work around that. You don't have to stop the antibiotic, mm-hmm. um, but it's good for whoever's following the INR to be aware of that. Right. Um, also, something to consider, and obviously we didn't go through all the interactions, but something to consider is the herbal products. Yeah. So a lot of people are taking herbal products because they think that they're all natural and that they don't even consider the fact that a um, herbal product could, could cause an interaction or a bleed risk especially. Um, but the way I always kind of remember it, the, the herbals that can cause a bleed risk are the ones that start with the G. Obviously, that's not always the case, but the ones that are we majored it's like we, the five G's or something like that. They say, yeah, um, garlic, ginger, ginkgo, ginseng, 
and I can't even think of what the fifth one would be. Maybe it's the four Gs. I thought it was. Um, oh well, we'll go with four Gs for now. Four Gs for now. We're coming back. We'll come back to it. <laughs> um, but then also uh, things like turmeric, which I see more people taking on uh, because it supposedly reduces inflammation in the body, and people take just gobs of that. Um, Interestingly, there's not bad evidence for that in um, either UC or Crohn's. Hmm. I can't remember which one, but I saw Grand Round's presentation. It's actually kind of interesting. Hmm. Yeah. We'll have to look into that and talk so about it. So keep an open mind. We'll see. <laughs> I'm on the fence. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we don't really think about them as interacting because they're not maybe not working on a SIP or um, P-glycoprotein or something like that. But uh, what they do is they inhibit the uh, platelet adhesion. And so when platelets are trying to aggregate... They either disrupt that signaling, they disrupt something um, on the platelet itself, whether it's a receptor so that it's not able to bind. And so you thin the blood out via the platelets not being able to um, have that aggregation. And so the blood is being already thinned out from the, the warfarin or, or even the NOAC, or DOAC, excuse me, um, or whatever the, the agent may be, that they also are running a risk for an increased risk and bleed um, by taking one of these supplements as well. And it's something that we don't a lot of times think about, but we need to make sure we're asking patients about herbal supplements. Yeah. Along with that is OTCs. I can't remember how many you mentioned, but something you're pretty much always going to run into is NSAIDs. Mm -hmm. Um, So, of course, aspirin. Avoid aspirin unless the patient is, the cards, wants them to stay on a low-dose aspirin or whatever. But if they're just taking it um, on their own, probably have them stop it or at least talk to the, whoever's managing their warfarin about whether they want to keep it or not. Um, ibuprofen, naproxen, um, both of those, you're concerned about increasing risk of bleed. Um, even Celebrex, I know it's supposed to be lower risk for GI bleed, but still probably avoid that. Um, and I would argue that it's not. Right. I, I, the data doesn't really hold up there either way. But um, the, well, I think we've talked about precision trial, but I was not not, not a fan. Yeah. Um, so Tylenol is fine. So go with Tylenol. Um, if you've got to go with um, anything, uh, as far as those go for pain, avoid the NSAIDs. So something to consider. And I did want to, I, I feel like I wasn't very clear with the duration of treatment. So like I said, again, three to 12 months um, for the first um, unprovoked, or I mean, I'm sorry, the first provoked DVT um, situations where you consider longer than 12 months. Uh, is really an unprovoked symptomatic PE potentially, um, even a first episode of unprovoked DVT, but definitely recurrent episodes. You're considering indefinite um, anticoagulation. So those are situations, like I said, it's very patient specific, um, but there are a lot of situations where you might say, hey, I want to keep them on this longer than three to six months or even a year. Yes, absolutely. Um, the other thing to consider would be, you know, if you see a patient that is on antiplatelet therapy as well as anticoagulation, definitely ask some questions Yeah, because there are indications for it. There are. It's kind yeah. of, that's a whole separate 15 podcast episodes, <laughs> but there are certain situations where maybe the patient is using anticoagulation for um, prevention uh, as, you know, for AFib or whatever it may be, and they also had stents placed just recently, so they're on antiplatelet therapy. Right. Um, so there are indications for it, so just be aware of that. Uh, don't think that, for the pharmacist, don't think that just because you see both that it's absolutely wrong and it's a mistake and tell them to stop one. <laughs> right. There are definitely times, and there, there are times when a patient might be on dual antiplatelet with an anticoagulant. I think there's some actually good data out there to say that um, you may only need one antiplatelet with the anticoagulant, even if they've had a stent placed and it's calls for dual. But um, that, like you said, that's a separate discussion. So yeah, definitely situations where you might need it. Uh, what else we got? That's pretty much all I got, I think. So um, did we talk about has blood? No, I, I mentioned bleeding risk, but yeah, you talk let's, about has blood. Let's talk about this just in case you're not familiar talk with Talk about it. what the heck you use that for. Yes. Um, and you may be able to feel it. You're probably closer to this than I am, Cole. But um, this is something you can use for, for warfarin specifically. Um, if you have a patient that you're trying to decide whether or not uh, they would be a candidate for warfarin or what their chances of having a bleed uh, on warfarin would be, and then we can use the has bled score. Um, so each category, the patient gets a point. So for the first one, we have hypertension which they say is a systolic blood pressure of greater than 160. Uh, we also have abnormal liver functions, um, which they say the bilirubin has to be two times 
the or more than two times the upper limit of normal, um, plus one or more liver enzymes have to be three times the upper limit of normal. Um, we also have to have abnormal renal function, uh, which they classify as uh, greater than 2.26 milligrams per deciliter uh, for a serum creatinine. Um, if they've had a past stroke, if they have a bleeding tendency or predisposition, so if that's obviously like a bleeding disorder, um, or if they've been, if you look at their chart and notice they've had a bleeding, a bleeding episode in the past, uh, that also counts. Um, the uh, the bile INRs, I don't, I can't remember what's that one. I don't even remember what that one was. Just if you can't get their INR under control. So gotcha. you're really having trouble getting them between that two and three. They come in um, right now and they're 1.6. They come in two weeks later and they're 3.5 and you barely adjusted their dose. So label INRs would increase their risk of bleeding. And they say less than 60% of the INR value is in the therapeutic range. So they actually have a, a set number. Right. Um, elderly patients, so patients that are 65 years and older, um, concomitant uh, antiplatelet agents, so like we just talked about that, and then also um, excessive alcohol use. And right. then you add all those up, and you give them a score. And so if the, if the patient has a score of 1, then they have a chance of having 1.02 bleeds per 100 patient years. For 2, 1.88. Three, it goes up to 3.74. And then if they have four points, it goes up to 8.7 bleeds per 100 patient years. So it kind of has a big jump uh, between three and four points. So right. it'd be something to, um, and then if you go higher than that, they say there's insufficient data to really give it a number. Right. But um, obviously, uh, if, if you have multiple risk factors, the patient does have a, a good chance of, or not a good chance necessarily, but like a much better chance of having a bleed. And so you'd want to make sure that you have that conversation with the patient and make sure they understand the risks of this medication. Right. Um, and so a couple of big points about the has bled. So um, he mentioned numbers. He mentioned that it increases your risk. Um, but what does that mean and how do you use that? Um, so it's really not like the CHADS VASC for AFib. There's no specific cutoff with those numbers that says, oh, yep, yeah, we're going to anticoagulate this patient, or no, we're not going to anticoagulate this patient. That's not really what the HADIS blood is used for. It's really used to give you an idea of what their bleed risk is, and you have to make a clinical decision as to whether you want to anticoagulate them or not, and if the risks outweigh the benefits. Frequently they do. Um, but there are two factors in the has bled that are modifiable. So most aren't, like age isn't modifiable, history of bleed is not modifiable, um, but blood pressure is modifiable, um, and one other one there is modifiable that is escaping me. Um, which other one would be? Yes. Blood, oh, blood pressure uh, being blood one. Blood pressure, and then... Um, Unless there's only one. I guess so. I mean, excess alcohol use, you can yeah. stop yeah. drinking. Okay. So we'll go we'll with say that. say it's that. Blood pressure and excess alcohol use. So there's a couple that are modifiable. Um, so you can talk to the patient, hey, this is increasing your risk for a bleed. So what can we do to get that down and decrease your risk? Um, but otherwise, that's all it's really used for. So just keep that in mind when you're calculating somebody's has bled. Or if a um, preceptor pimps you about that, uh, it's not like a hard and fast thing that's going to determine therapy. It's really a clinical decision tool. Yes. And it's usually on most of the uh, calculators that you have, like Lexicomp and uh, yeah. UpToDate and all those. MDCalc, Global RPH, it'll be on those. Yeah, so it's pretty easy to find and calculate, get an idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's some anticoagulation sure. meds. VTE, it's an overview. We've done a lot of overviews of disease states. I think um, soon enough we're going to start diving a little more yeah. in detail about, like, take one specific topic and kind of tear that apart really look at the data um, around that. And I should also mention that if you have any questions about anticoagulation, chest guidelines are going to be um, probably your go-to for that. Um, not necessarily our word, but of course, <laughs> totally listen to us. Oh yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. But always, you know, if you have any questions, refer to the chest guidelines, but yeah. otherwise, Chuckle, yeah, Chuckle I, professionals. I think we'll, um, we'll start, you know, piecemealing some of these topics and yeah. really delving into the data and so you can have some evidence-based knowledge. Yes. We definitely, uh, we'll have to pick like a trial or two and then really go deep with those and sure. kind, of, kind of look at them. Yeah, but we'll do various things. So, you know, there's something in it for everybody. Yeah. yeah. So stay tuned because you're not going to want to 
could not gonna want to miss it. <laughs> um, also, if you guys do listen to the podcast, you enjoy it, um, we would really, really appreciate it. It would, it would help us out tremendously um, if you would leave a rating or a comment, even um, give us some feedback. Um, you know, if if you have suggestions or if you think it's terrible and you think we need to do something better, um, send us an email. We'd like to hear that too. Yeah. I mean, we're not uh, by any means saying that we're uncoachable. Um, we're super new to this too. So we want to make this as entertaining as possible for you guys. Um, and also, uh, you know, somewhat valuable. So we want you guys to be, uh, getting your time's worth when you're listening to us. So please let us know what we can do. And remember that this is all free. So be nice America and various other countries. We actually have a lot of um, international listeners and and we love them too. Yeah. And if you're not nice, it's fine. We'll get over it. But (laughs) we're still glad you're listening. (laughs) And, uh, yeah, leave us a comment that would really, really help us out. It helps us in the rankings when we're going up against all the other big, bad podcasts. Sure. So, and then uh, also for Alexa, if you guys listen to the Alexa flash briefing, we now have a video yes. flash briefing, which I'm so excited about. Um, I'm so not a computer programmer. And it probably would have <laughs> taken me five seconds if I had been. But, uh, yeah, I'm not. So it took me a lot longer. And now that we have the uh, video flash briefing, we're going to start going pretty hard on that. And so check that out if you have an Alexa show or Alexa spot and um, let us know what you think. If you could leave us a rating on that, that would also be tremendous. And then uh, shoot us any suggestions or reach out to us on any social media platforms. We'd love to hear from you. It's totally quiet out there. I mean, we get lonely. Yeah. Which uh, there's a surprising amount of people that contact us about various things, clinical questions. Got a clinical question just today, I think, this yeah, morning, right? I think so. Well, it, we'll, we'll get random things too, like, hey, uh, got any ideas for my journal club? <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is kind of it's funny. Like, do your own work, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I'll still answer them. I don't yeah, care. No, we'll, I, I don't care. We will give you an idea. Just yeah. heads up. We'll just think in our mind that you're just, uh, you're, you know, you're just looking for. I just like the fact that, like, you think that. Okay, I need a journal club that's going to be all time. I know where to go. <laughs> there you go. That's and true. Hit us up on Instagram. So that's kind of the way I look at it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so that's pretty fun. So we definitely like hearing hearing about that. And other healthcare professionals too. We by no means only hang out with the pharmacists. So very true. Let us know if you are. Uh, and another one. So. Yeah. Cole's got all kinds of different ones he hangs out <laughs> with. So keeping it interprofessional. But we really appreciate y'all listening. And we will see you soon. Later.